Welcome back, everyone, to Hearts of Iron 4, Thousand Week Reich. And this time, we're taking a look at the Republic of China, the most glorious country in the world, of course. For some time now, the Republic of China has stood as Asia's rising potential hegemon ever since Japan fell outside the looming outside power of the United States. Established in 1912 with the fall of the Qing Empire and the Xinhai Revolution, the old republic quickly devolved into war orgasm. The Chinese Civil War, put on hold by the wartime truce between the Nationalists and the Communists, soon broke out yet again after the defeat of Japan, leading to the victory of the Kuomintang. China was finally truly whole again. And this is where we start our story. Basically, what's going on over here is that as our good old uh, Thousand Week Reich developers have just told us, uh, considering the way the Pacific Theater went for the United States in the Thousand Week Reich universe, China is a lot better off in this uh, in this timeline than many others. And in fact, it's also under the KMT. So it's basically united Taiwan with China. Uh, you never had, you know, the KMT running away to Taiwan and all that. But there's problems. As you can see, there's countrywide protests because right now uh, the KMT rule is not doing too great. As you can see, while internationally Jiang, Chang, uh, or Jiang, gives the impression of a powerful unified nationalist party ruling China with unity and efficiency, with himself at the top, the truth is far from that. The KMT itself is a mess of conflicting figures and interests, not to mention warlords still holding considerable power over the provinces. Jiang may be at the top, but if he struggles to hold together these, uh, but he struggles to hold together these competing interests. General Sun Li Zhen is speaking out. He denounces President Jiang's vision of a brand new nationalistic China. So we, we have a lot of political turmoil. That is compounded by the fact that the army itself is not very unified because warlordism is still around. It's not been taken out of the picture like it was mostly, not entirely, but mostly in real life by the, the CCP. So we have that most of our uh, territory is somehow infested by certain warlord factions, such as the Sibei, the, the Northwestern Maz in, well, the Northwest. Several types of them, in fact. Several types of Makliks. Then we have um, the Dongbei faction, the Northeastern Army uh, in control of Manchuria. Then we have the Guangxi faction in Guangxi, and we have the Yunnan faction in Yunnan. So that's just the warlord flex that you know and love from a lot of other, uh, a lot of other uh, Hearts of Iron Four mods. But also we have, of course, the glorious Shanxi click, Yan Shishan, just sort of hanging out of his mountains. So yeah, warehouse right in Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai has had one of its many warehouses raided by our police force for allegedly holding opium and other drugs, of course. Damn criminals. Ah, looks like there's a bit of a connection to Taiwan. Smuggled American planes, <laughs> of course. So our 
agents and lobbyists in America have successfully secured new shipments of American aircraft. <laughs> Interesting. Our agents and lobbyists. I love that. So yeah, basically, uh, outside of China, we are projecting this sort of image of Great China is back. But uh, there are problems within. Not only within the army, with all the different factions, within the party too. Uh, we're gonna get to that in a little bit, but there's a lot of clicks within the KMT as well. And other than the KMT, we also have different types of political forces. Um, still continuing the anti-KMT struggle, such as the communists, who are not completely vanished. Uh, the, the, the CCP still has activities all throughout the country, and so we have the left-wing crackdown modifier, and so also this provides Chiang Kai-shek uh, the ability to sort of continue the Chinese martial law, uh, saying effectively this is needed to stop the communism and all that. So that's about it for now. Uh, unrest, we have unrest in Taiwan. So after the end of the Second Sino-Japanese War, the Republic of China liberated Taiwan from Japanese rule, of course. Uh, at first, the locals rejoiced and welcomed the Republican government back, but living standards have allegedly declined since the arrival of the Taiwan Provincial Chief Executive's office. Chief Executive. Uh, a after a series of riots and uprisings occurred during the early stage of reintegration, with a major incident occurring in 1950 as an accidental killing uh, sparked over 20 days of riots and civil conflict between groups of local militia and Taiwanese garrisons. This heavily mirrors what happens with the KMT retreating to Taiwan in real life. With things like the 228, I believe, incident. Uh, essentially, when the KMT runs away from mainland China to Taiwan in real life, you have that um, the locals are first like, okay, at least you're not Japanese. But then it turns out that um, essentially the KMT with their armed forces that had escaped from the mainland and with their essentially power base resting essentially mainly in mainland refugees that were uh, escaping the communist takeover, uh, the KMT was essentially building, was essentially kind of colonizing Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan's super complex, we're not going to get into it, but. It, this mirrors quite heavily in real life, except we don't have like a massive, um, you know, couple million people migration to Taiwan, but still, obviously the KMT is backed up by the entirety of China, and so its role on Taiwan is being resented by a population that would just kind of like, like it to be left alone most of the time. So today in Taipei and Kaohsiung, uh, which is a city in the south of Taiwan, uh, thousands of Taiwanese locals gather to mourn the death of these rebels and protest the sinicization that seeks the destruction of their culture, targeting internal immigrants, businesses, and the local authorities while chanting for greater autonomy and complete independence from the corrupt Nanjing government. Leftist elements are suspected to be part of the driving force behind this protest, but the Taiwanese government claims that the situation is under control. So that's the situation with Taiwan. Is it even a core? Yes, it is a core, but we've got problems there as well. And uh, yeah, well, we do have the House of Cards. So essentially, uh, what Jiang does to deal with the House of Cards, or at least to keep it, yo, okay, uh, or at least to keep it under control, to keep it up, and keep it from tumbling down. Kekkonen, 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 Kekkonen. Kekkonen, 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 Kekkonen. He's gonna do the good old target communists. Obviously. So, if Jiang, the KMT, and China are, as a whole are truly to come together in advance, the communist threat must be thoroughly stamped out. Okay. And we have British control in West Africa. I like how the text was imperialists it's just like yes of course the imperialists so i suppose they're doing the shut down the elections and they're trying to make it join the commonwealth of course although yeah how oh, very interesting 
Anyway, uh, the House of Cards, as I said, is not only composed of the military, but also of the um, party itself. Now, the KMT was always a factionalistic party. It wasn't really a big tent, but it, it wasn't, so it wasn't meant to be uh, representing 700 million viewpoints. But you have that you have uh, the left KMT, but the left KMT has mostly been destroyed by the events of the past especially 30 years. Then you have the political science clique, which is a quote unquote liberal faction. You have the conservatives are supposed are represented by the Guangxi clique. So that's like the KMT center kind of thing. The KMT Jiang loyalists. And then the blue shirts click. Um, now the blue shirts click and the Jiang KMT click also have another faction between them called the CC club. The central, uh, sorry, the, sensor, the central club click, the CC click. Uh, but that comes into play later on it, it's not that important right now and basically the the blue shirts are under Dai Li who was the head of the secret sort of serve sort of secret police in nationalist China and um, they are fascists because the blue shirts in real life was this fascist society within the KMT uh, the KMT itself in the 30s was basically fascist but we're not gonna get into it. So, despite the defeat of Mao's army, communism remains a force within Chinese society, a threat just hidden from the from view, but under our noses all nonetheless. We must root out all who threaten our nations with such ideas, or else they will rise up again like they did after the long march. Of course. Hunt them down! Destroy them! Kill them! So now we are going to do the handling of the clicks, uh, the southern border, and creating a skateboard. So essentially, uh, what Jiang's plan is, is to start up trouble with socialist Vietnam. Essentially to both provide an external enemy to unite the KMT behind, and to sort of scapego scapegoat his own failures in dealing with the rest of the left-winger activity in China, and plus uh, to sort of restore Chinese greatness in Southeast Asia or whatever. This is in part aligned with the Huxia Doctrine. Renowned Chinese intellectual, philologist, and philosopher Hu Xie has shocked China and the world by emerging from his self-imposed isolation in Beijing University. More shockingly still, he presents what calls the Chinese path to greatness in a series of highly publicized papers calling for direct confrontation with the West. In a sharp pivot from most Western friendly tendencies, Hu demands the implementation of Chinese style democracy across Asia and the sponsorship of foreign movements across Asia opposed to both Western liberalism and communism. The American government has condemned the paper as an unacceptable violation of diplomatic protocol, but Hu Xia has defended his statements as a necessary move for China to build an Asia free from tyranny and ready for democracy on their own terms. So this sort of rising China is giving birth to the first theories of great Chinese domination in the Far East. And that's obviously based. The May Day of 1952 led to one of the bloodiest riots in Japanese history. Riot police and the protesters clashed, and the situation was getting out of hand, deciding, with the government deciding to order the police to use lethal force against the students. These orders were ignored by several regiments, and in some cases, officers defected to the protesters, strengthening the protesters' firepower. Later that day, protesters alongside the militia forces formed fanatical students managed to seize the apparatus of state. With fresh elections held since the resignation of Syngman Rhee, a broad coalition of left-wing parties has won the vote in Korea, beating the moderate conservatives and liberals running against them. Oppressed by the old regime, socialists of all kinds, from anarchists to moderates to nationalist communists, have banded together to win power in the election. The threat to the new government from reactionary forces is great, but 
So, it is now clear what the problem with the world order in 1952 is. Clearly, the Vietnamese dogs and their buddies across Asia, their communist subversive allies, have plotted against China. A simple glance at this map is enough to see a red wall encircling China from India to Burma to Indochina to Japan to Korea to Mongolia. All these communists are plotting to bring down the great middle kingdom. Or at least that's probably what Jenga is talking about uh, in his speeches. So we'll teach the Vietnamese election a lesson. In a speech directly from the Generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek, the KMT has announced communist-ruled Vietnam, blaming Vietnam for harboring and aiding Chinese communist traitors. Jiang vowed that such submersions would be punished by whatever force China could bring to bear, should it continue. A clear threat of escalation and possibly war. It remains to be seen how Vietnam will respond. We'll see. The time has finally come. Our allies in North Vietnam, ready to resist the scourge of communism with our support, are ready to rise up. It is finally within our grasp to rid the Asian continent of communism and bring vengeance to those Chinese communists who have escaped into Vietnam. Our forces, while unprepared, can surely bring a crushing victory with overwhelming numbers. Now we only have to send in the men, and we shall be triumphant for China!